Thank you very much for your kind words, um, Sue. And I'm very pleased to be part of this um, conversation. We certainly need um, Ubuntu. We, we uh, don't need social distancing. We need physical distancing and social solid, solidarity um, at this time. So as Sue said, I will be um, talking about, I think, my, my own journey with um, Ubuntu and how I came to it and how I've engaged with it um, over the years. And um, I hope that in the conversation that will follow, that I will in, be enriched um, by your insights um, on um, the concept or philosophy or value of Ubuntu. So I have a PowerPoint um, presentation. So um, I've titled the presentation Ubuntu and Indigenous Knowledge in the Academy. So um, I thought I'd first just say something about Ubuntu and the human being. So in, in many um, African languages, um, the word human being, in this case in Nguni languages, is Umuntu. But Umuntu is constituted by um, very different dimensions of the human being. And the last one that I um, have highlighted there is the dimension of the human being that is called um, Ubuntu, which is humanist. So Ubuntu, um, as the name is in Nguni languages, um, and Butu in Sutu, and there are similar um, constructs in other African languages, is derived from proverbial, proverbial expressions in several um, languages. So it's not only a linguistic concept, but has a normative con connotation embodying how we ought to relate to the other. In other words, what our moral obligation is towards um, the other. So in the Kosa language, Ubuntu derives from the expression Muntu, Ugumuntu, Ungabanye Bantu, and that's not easily translatable, but it means that each individual's humanity is ideally expressed in relationship with others. So what I thought um, I, I would do here, and some people might trouble what I'm doing with Ubuntu, but I'm doing it to, to make a distinction here between Descartes um, cogito and Ubuntu. So Descartes, Descartes cogito that we are very familiar with is I think, um, therefore I am. And what that captures is the dualism that characterizes much of Western um, thought and also explains the privileging of epistemology, the privileging of knowledge in Western um, education. Now, this could be traced right back to um, Plato and Plato's forms um, and the philosopher Gilbert Rao, I think it was, who said that all of Western philosophy are footnotes to Plato. And then if one looks at Ubuntu, it's, it means because we are, therefore I am. So there's no separation of ontology, epistemology, and um, axiology. In other words, our actions um, in the world. So the three are implicated, um, implicated in one another. And um, when post or new materialist um, scholars or post human scholars um, bring these um, three together and they talk about um, an, an ethical onto epistemology, the, that notion has been um, understood for many years by indigenous peoples across the world um, and on the continent of Africa. And often homage is not paid um, to the knowledges of indigenous people. 
when these new constructs are in a sense so-called um, um, named. So um, how I came to Ubuntu, and I'm sharing this because um, I didn't grow up with, um, with the notion of Ubuntu. I always had a very strong um, uh, social justice um, uh, belief, um, and that arose out of, uh, of course, growing up as a child and as a young adult in apartheid um, South, South Africa. So there was always been that strong sensibility in relation to social justice. But um, I didn't grow up with the concept of Ubuntu. So on the 27th of uh, March, 1986, William um, Mahoba, um, had an essay published in the Sunday Times, and the essay was entitled In Search of the Ideal Democratic Model for South Africa. And he argued that the African philosophy of Ubuntu should be central to a democratic model um, for South Africa. This was the emerging um, um, democratic South Africa. Now, about the uniqueness of Ubuntu that he uh, talks about in the article, in fact, this is what he says. He says that Ubuntu is unique in the following respects. It emphasizes respect for the non-material order that exists in us and among us. It fosters man's, um, and as he uses some sexist language, um, respect for um, himself for others and for the environment. And I have that in bold for a particular reason. It has spirituality. It has remained non-racial. It accommodates other um, cultures. And it is the invisible force uniting Africans worldwide. So I've also highlighted that for a particular reason. So a few years um, down the line, as I engaged in international conferences and engaged with colleagues, um, particularly in this case, in the area of philosophy of education, there were some South African colleagues, um, and two of them in particular, that criticized um, Ubuntu. And I say they criticized it because I don't think it was really a critique, because critique is dialectic. It is, um, in other words, it is thesis and antithesis. Um, and I'm going to now talk about two of those criticisms. So Insulin and um, Wostemke criticized um, Mahoba's claim that Ubuntu fosters respect um, for the environment. And they argued that Ubuntu is speciesist. In other words, um, it's about relationship between people. So the focus is actually on, on people and therefore reinforces a human nature um, divide. So in other words, they were saying that by definition, um, Ubuntu is actually anthropocentric. The second criticism was they pointed out that the idea of Ubuntu um, as um, an invisible force that unites um, Africans worldwide um, appears to gainsay the atrocities that continue to plague the African continent. And so the year they refer to the staggering um, incidents of genocide, dictatorships, autocratic rule, corruption, sexism, and so I can go on, homophobia, environmental degradation, um, and they say because, um, so this idea that um, was um, mooted by um, Mahoba is sort of problematic for a, for a second reason. What um, Insulin and Osemke did was to write about this, talk about it, and they got exposure in term, even in terms of keynote addresses um, in parts of the world where there were not many people from the global south um, who could challenge these um, ideas. And so they were sharing it mainly um, with a European, um, American, um, Australian audience. 
And um, it was at this point that I felt that I needed to engage with what they were doing because it troubled me um, with what they were sharing. And so this is how I actually came um, to engage with Ubuntu. So um, initially in my work that I did, um, I tended to agree with them on the issue around um, the environment, but I later changed that um, after um, I had engaged with the work of um, Mu Rofe. So what I've argued is that um, insulin and Hostemki, um, that their reading of Ubuntu is actually flawed. And what I said is that one needs to understand Ubuntu in relation to um, another broader concept, which is in the Shona language, which is the notion of Ukama. And Ukama means um, relatedness to the entire cosmos. So if one looks at Ubuntu um, in relation to Ukama, then what Ubuntu is, is the concrete concrete form of Ukama. So in other words, human interrelationship within um, society is actually a microcosm of relationality within the universe. So that's the first point and the first um, argument that I made. The second was to, in, um, to invoke um, Felix Guattari's um, work and specifically um, his work in his book that was entitled um, The Three Ecologies. Now, for those of you who might not know um, Felix Guattari's work, Felix Guattari was a French um, psychoanalyst that collaborated in, in, in much of his work with the French philosophy Gilles um, Deliers. So what Guattari said in his book, The Three Ecologies, he said that there are three interlocking dimensions of environment. And those three interlocking dimensions um, is the self, the social, and nature, or in other words, the other than human world or the more than human world. He argued that these three dimensions are inextricably, inextricably bound up with one another and that they need to be understood um, transversely. In other words, when destruction is observed in one dimension, then it will also be evident in the two other dimensions. So if there's destruction um, of the self, one would also witness destruction um, in the social as well as um, in nature. In the same way, um, healing works transversely. That is, that, that is my particular argument. So if there's healing um, of the self, then there would also be healing um, of the social and healing um, of nature or humans as in humans um, interaction with nature. So, um, so what I've argued um, is that insulin and Oshemki's reading, um, okay. let me, Okay, so here's a further response to the, to the criticism. So um, here I say that Guattari's notion of trans facility helps us to appreciate the notion of Ukama when he argues that when suffering is witnessed in one ecological register, it will also be witnessed in the other ecological registers. Africa's suffering evident in the staggering incidents of genocide, patriarchy, and so we can go on, um, should be understood as the breaking or erosion of Ukama through among other influences, years of colonial rule and apartheid capitalism. Healing um, in one ecological register will therefore effect healing in other ecological um, registers. So if one looks at colonialism and one looks at apartheid um, capitalism, then of course it did um, damage to people's um, psyches, but it also separated people in all kinds of ways. Um, if one thinks about um, uh, capitalism 
um, with the discovery of gold and mining, which actually forced um, men off the land um, and the, the breaking of kinship um, networks. And one also looks at the impact of that um, uh, on um, relationships between humans and, and the more than, than or other than human world. Um, so people might say, but um, yeah, I'm not too sure about the issues around um, homophobia, um, dictatorships, um, and so on. It's interesting, and I'll just um, refer to two of them. If one looks at the issue of homosexuality, then of the 72 countries with, um, with such a law, at least this was in what was on the books in 2018, at least half of them were one subject to some sort of British rule. So there's been lots of work, um, and this is well documented, of the relationship between British colonialism and homosexuality. In fact, um, st some studies um, have suggested that um, it's in 60% of the countries where homosexuality is illegal, um, those countries were under British um, rule um, in some or other way at some or other point in history. If one looks at the issue of xenophobia as another example, then Oitu um, Melo Mahulehu points out that um, query query is a word um, that has been in use long before 19, um, 90, 1994, but of course it emerged again um, in several waves of xenophobic attacks on um, on citizens of other, you know, African countries. And that his grandparents say that the word has been in use as long as he can remember. And he writes, from what I gather, um, it has undertones which speak of how black Africans are believed to be subhuman um, and to have a pungent smell. Now this is, this is what um, the meaning is, and this is what black people um, are saying about other black people. Now that seems odd and that seems strange. And that notion can only be um, because of the influence of British colonialism um, in, 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 in countries like, um, like South Africa. So um, what I've now done is to just suggest um, that these are some of the, um, some of the ideas that I've spoken about now um, is actually captured in, um, in these um, papers um, that, that I have written if, if um, colleagues would like to actually read um, a lot further um, on this. And so um, my first contribution really was to um, develop a Ubuntu as, a, as an environmental um, ethic and bring this um, to bear on the field of environmental um, education. So that was the first engagement and I think the first um, scholarly work and contribution um, that I made. Then um, very briefly, um, a former PhD student of mine who also became my colleague, um, um, we worked on this idea of Ubuntu and, and assessment. And if one looks at the etymological root of assessment, then it um, is the Latin verb um, asadere or asadere, which means to sit beside. So um, its invocation counteracts the cold, I think, and distant, and or some would say heartless assessment practices that um, have characterized Western or Westernized, uh, Westernized education systems. So Ubuntu makes possible um, a rethinking of assessment as um, asadera. And so what we write about it is um, uh, the following. We elaborate um, on, I think, two core values of Ubuntu in relation to assessment. Um, and this is what we say that humanness, which is warm tolerance, understanding, um, peace, um, humanity, and caring, which is empathy, sympathy, helpfulness, um, and friendliness, capture the spirit in which assessment um, ought to be conducted. 
So humanist towards um, humanist, humanist towards and caring unconditionally for learners are fundamental to effective teaching and learning. So learners are likely to experience assessment as positive only when they are sure that the teacher or lecturer who guides the learning process um, is humane and care and the caring person and is fully aware of their fears um, and the difficulties. So um, I've just included that um, very briefly to talk about how um, I've engaged with assessment um, and Ubuntu. And they are just again two papers um, that share some of these ideas, uh, one that I wrote with Peter Beats and the other one that he worked on on his own. The next is to talk a little bit about um, Ubuntu and capability theory and some of the work that I've done in relation um, to this. So um, there are many people that are working with um, capability um, theory as opposed to human capital um, theory in higher education. And many of you would know um, the work of Melanie Walker in South Africa. Um, she's done quite a lot of um, work in relation to higher education. So capability theory emerged as um, an approach which shifts the discussion away from the crude measure of economic growth in determining a nation's quality of life. So away from reducing the human being to its economic value. And capability theory, of course, has its origins um, in the work of the Nobel laureate um, Amartya Sen. And some of his ideas were developed further by um, the liberal philosopher um, Martha Nisbam. So what, what Nisbam does, um, she, um, she suggests that there are several um, capabilities. Um, and I'll just go um, through that quite quickly. So the capability of life, um, being able to live a life um, of a normal human being, bodily health, bodily integrity, the importance um, of senses, imagination, and thought, um, emotions, being able to have attachments to things and people outside of oneself, practical reason, affiliation, um, the capability um, in relation to other species, so being able to live with concern for and in, in relation to other um, to the other than human world, um, play and also control of one's in environment. So what in the work that I've done, and it's an um, idea that um, Nisbam talks about, she talks about this idea of a architectonic capability. And that's a capability that actually pervades all of the other um, capabilities. So in my work, what I did was to argue that Ubuntu um, could be such an architectonic um, capability. So I write um, that Ubuntu conveys the idea that one cannot rely, realize um, or express one's true self by exploiting or deceiving others or acting in unjust ways towards them. So being able to play, to use one's senses, to imagine, to think, to reason, to, to produce works, to have control over one's environment, these things are not possible without others. These capabilities um, can be expressed only in interdependent relationships with other human beings and the biophysical world. So Ubuntu conveys the idea of becoming human, that humanness um, unfolds as an ongoing process in relationship with um, human and other um, biophysical communities. By definition, humanity implies respecting the dignities of others, their bodily integrity, and so on. Ubuntu embraces Nazbaum's capability of affiliation, but is more than affiliation since it provides not only some of the capabilities Nazbaum um, identifies, but all of them. So that's um, just to give you a sense of um, the work that I did um, on Ubuntu in relation to capability um, theory. And there's one paper um, that captures some of these ideas uh, that was published in Indigenous Knowledge Journal Indilinga. So um, 
then I want to move on to say how I've engaged with Ubuntu in relation to curriculum. So um, the notion of Ubuntu curator, um, I coined in a keynote address that was delivered at the fifth um, triennial conference um, of the International Association for the Advancement of Curriculum Studies at the University of Ottawa in 2015. And this notion brings together the autobiographical method of curriculum, which um, was uh, termed curator by William Piner. So curator um, is derived from the, the Latin, I mean, curator is the Latin word from which um, curriculum de derives and it means to run. I think it's the same Latin root for um, the word that we use um, in the financial world, currency, because it gives a sense of flow. And I think it's also the same root um, of the word um, current as an electric current, which also means the flow, the flow of electrons. So, and it's different to um, the Grecian or Grecian meaning of curator, which means a chariot track. So the former, the Latin root focuses on the runner of the race and the latter, the Grecian or Grecian, um, focuses on the race track to be run. Now, um, the Grecian or Grecian um, notion of curriculum is what has actually dominated Western education and continues to dominate um, understandings of curriculum um, today. So curriculum um, is largely defined um, following um, Ralph Tyler and into higher education. It moved into the work of John Biggs and his notion of constructive alignment um, and so on in outcomes-based um, education that the race is actually predetermined and that all um, learners, all students must follow the particular track that was already mapped out. And of course they are kept on track um, or in track and on track by the disciplines which they follow. And of course they are tracked through um, assessment. And uh, what curator does is to shift um, um, the idea away from some predetermined or preordinate curriculum to the notion that we need to think of the person. Um, that's actually running the race. And each of, for each one of us, that race is different, as William Piner says, um, due to significations of gender, race, race, sexual orientation, um, and so on. Um, so Curita has resonance um, with Ubuntu because um, curator, in a sense, um, gives one this idea of the unfolding of the human um, being, the being and the becoming of the human being. And as Ramosi states, humanness or Ubuntu suggests both a condition of being and a state of becoming, of openness or ceaseless unfolding. It is thus opposed to any kind of ism, including humanism, well, this tends to suggest a condition of finality, a closeness, or a kind of absolute, um, either inescapable of or resistant to any further movement. And so um, I talk um, about what Ubuntu Gureri does, that it shifts the registers of reference away from the individual human being to an assemblage of human human nature in other words, subjectivity becomes ecological. Moreover, the subject is always in becoming and the becoming of, the of a pedagogical life is relational. So the subject becomes in relation to other humans and the more other than human world. So Ubuntu Curere is also anti-humanist. Put differently, Ubuntu Curere um, negates the construction of a molar identity 
that is a screen against which anything different is um, othered in a negative sense. So Ubuntu Kireri has resonance with um, new materialist uh, post-human theory in that it embraces an ontology of imminence that there is a material imminent plane that connects everything in the cosmos and from which all actualized forms um, unfold. And then lastly, Ubuntu Kireri opens up multiple causings um, for developing post-human sensibilities, driven by the power of potential, which is a positive power, instead of potestas, which is a negative hierarchical um, power that colonizes. So potential that connects, expresses desire, and sustains life. It is this power that connects curriculum scholars across national boundaries and makes possible conversations where we can hear what people do, how they do it, how they think about things, and the hope um, that we could learn from each other. So there are a number of um, papers that um, talk to this, and this notion of Ubuntu Kureri has also been taken up further by colleagues at UKZN, which is the last publication at the bottom. And so um, the next and the last um, section that I talk about um, is um, on Ubuntu and, and post-humanism. And there's been much talk about um, a new geological epoch, um, the Anthropocene. Um, so we find ourselves, many have argued, at the historical moment when the human has become a, a geological force capable of affecting um, all life on the planet, an epoch known as the Anthropocene. But the Anthropocene, Timothy Morton states, is a strange name uh, indeed, because in this new geological epoch, non-humans make decisive contact with human beings. So our lives are becoming increasingly, increasingly entangled and um, mangled, uh, imbricated with technology. And many people are arguing that we, in a sense, are becoming um, um, cyborg. And there are serious questions now about um, what the unit of reference for, a, for the human being um, now is. And of course, technology is developing to, um, to a point that, of course, the, the technology itself has the potential to um, destroy um, human life and, and all life on the planet. Um, it is, I think, well known that in the Obama era, there were more um, human beings that were killed by drones than were killed by um, armor and weapons handled by human beings in, in the Bush era. So I then talk about um, the crisis of, of human, humanism, that the Anthropocene is actually a manifestation of the crisis of human, humanism. And Levinas um, has spoken about um, the crisis of human, humanism that began with the inhuman events of human history, um, 1914 war, the Russian Revolution, uh, refuting itself in um, Stalinism, fascism, and so on, and goes right down to talk about socialism it gets entangled in bureaucracy, and I've also added um, to that environmental degradation. So what is the problem with humanism? Human, humanism um, defines or portrays the human in a particular way, which can be traced back to the classical um, ideal of man first formulated by um, Protagoras, as the measure, as man, the measure of all things, and later renewed in the Italian Renaissance as the universal model and representation in Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man. Um, so when human is defined, when the focus is on the essence of the human being and not the being of the human and becoming of the human, the upshot is that others are declared um, as less human or non-human. So um, the Vitruvian man, um, 
that was portrayed by um, Leonardo da Vinci was of course first um, the, the man um, that is physically perfect, um, geometrically um, perfect, but of course it becomes reconstructed um, as um, in the European Enlightenment and the ideal man actually becomes um, a mole identity um, that's European, um, that's white, that's male, and that is developed further, that's able-bodied, um, etc. Heterosexual. So Western education, I think, is chiefly concerned with the cultivation of rational autonomous beings rather than the whole human being. So it privileges the individual over community and it privileges the cognitive over other domains. It's based on, a, on a mainly based on dualistic thought. And so we become used to things like policy practice, teacher, student, um, et cetera. The post-human um, predicament um, responses to the crisis of human, human beings have, have, of humanism has produced the condition, um, the post-human. And the post-human um, introduces a shift in our thinking about what the unit um, of common reference for our species now is. The predicament concerns um, post-humans positive and negative dimensions. On the one hand, there is the imperative of um, embracing all of life and its connective connectedness so that life is sustained. And on the other hand, resisting the negative um, of the post-human robotics, drones, artificial intelligence, biological warfare, the modification of the human um, body, the development of eco-phages um, that's only spoken about in science um, and fiction at this point. But um, it's how one resists the negative without becoming technophobic. And so Ubuntu um, is a, a potential response to the post-human predicament. Um, invoking Ubuntu holds possibilities for overcoming the post-human predicament because Ubuntu affirms the embeddedness um, of life, but it also counteracts the negative aspects that characterize the post-human, the potentially dehumanizing effects of robotics, the modification of um, the human body, biological warfare, nanotechnology, um, and so on. So it embraces many aspects of the post-human, but it doesn't forget um, the human and the importance of um, the relationality between um, humans. So it affirms humanness and um, our common humanity. So education informed by this notion of Ubuntu um, as, a, as a response to um, the post-human predicament and the post-human condition suggests that the unit of reference in education ought to be uh, not to be the individual subject, but that subject Activity ought to be viewed as being ecological, I think is a point I, I made before. So it concerns a shift from the arrogant eye to the humble eye, to the eye that is embedded, embodied, extended, and enacted. So it concerns a shift from, as I mentioned earlier, I think, therefore I am, to because we are, therefore I am. So it is based on cooperation, collaboration, rather than competition. And when education is enacted, um, the teacher or lecturer and learner or student becomes um, imperceptible. So learner and teacher and the knowledge that they co-construct um, or exchange are in becoming. It is opposed to any a priori image of a pedagogical life. It holds that there are multiple pathways for the becoming of a pedagogical life. The becoming of a life is only constrained um, by the other, including the more other than human world in positive ways. And so I've added um, some papers again, uh, where I've engaged um, in a lot more depth with some of these ideas. But uh, that brings me to, I think, the end of my engagement.
which talks about my initial engagement um, that arose out of my concerns of how Ubuntu um, was being, in, in my view, misread and brought that to the attention of the field of environmental education. And then the movement uh, to talking about Ubuntu in terms of assessment and then Ubuntu in relation to capability theory, as well as Ubuntu in relation to curriculum and the notion of Ubuntu as curere, and then now also Ubuntu as response um, to the post-human predicament or post-human condition. So thank you very much, and over to you, Sue. Thank you so much, Leo.